Hey, Red, is this on? What's going on? Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear us? Yay. Oh, look at that. Welcome, everybody. Yeah. This is the very first live Katie Halper show, and I am not Katie Halper. <laughs> Contrary to popular belief. Hi, guys. This is uh, the one and only Katie Halper. Round of applause for Katie. I didn't even know. Thank you. That, thank you, Gabe. This is Gabe Pacheco. And Gabe Pacheco is a hilarious comedian, the hardest working man in showbiz. He is my my wingman, my co-pilot, besides Jesus. Mm-hmm. My other co-pilot. We share Jesus. He we is both do. our he's both our co-pilots. He is. You know? Like a divorced family with one one, right. one kid. I get him on weekends. Yeah, one of us comes from the people who are basically responsible for Jesus Christ. I think the Jews in the room know what I'm talking about. We think of ourselves as being in a transracial friendship. Yeah. 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 Uh, and that you are constantly taken for a Jew. Constantly passing. Passing. He passes. Actually, funny story, guys. He's half Mexican. And I get you know, spoken to in Spanish a lot. All the time. What up, mommy? So this guy over here. This guy over here? Reggie Johnson. Me? Yeah. I'm the straight guy. He is. Of, between the two of them. I mean, not that there's anything. Yeah. The three of us. I don't know. I, well, however it's described. <laughs> You, wow, this is people so know who I am. This is wow. so exciting for you guys, for us. It's very good to see all these yes. real faces. Yes. That's it. But probably almost as much of a draw as the radio show you see before you may have been our special guest tonight. What? We have a special guest? According to Wired Magazine, this guy is the hardest blogging man in hip-hop. What? Yeah. Jay Smooth, everyone. Yeah. Also, the man behind... The Underground Railroad. Some people would take issue with that attribution. But yes, the Underground Railroad is actually the longest running hip hop radio, radio show, show in, in New, New York. York. And he's the man behind the Ill Doctrine video series. You may have seen his videos on Don Lemon and respectability politics. Not, not on his show. Oh, no. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> and when he tells us that his rant about saggy pants and littering and no wedding, no womb was just common sense advice that everyone should hear, he's willfully ignoring the context in which he spoke. A national conversation about the death of Trayvon Martin, about how we as a country could let him be killed, let his killer go unpunished, and let our children have to go out in the world knowing that they could be next because our system is not set up to protect them. But you've probably seen him on MSNBC. Rachel Maddow, incidentally, did call him and his work genius. How'd that make you feel? Good. Okay, good. <laughs> and he was named by Salon one of the sexiest men alive. And I get to sit next to him. So here's your drink, dark and stormy. And we're doing that because you said that was one of your favorite drinks. Yes. Why? I should have picked a drink that had an interesting anecdote attached to it. It's um, not a metaphor for something? <laughs> um, no. Well, there used to be a great club named Black Betty in Williamsburg that my friends used to DJ at, and Dark and Stormy was my regular drink there. It's a little homage to the New York that once was. Mm. It was already somewhat gentrified, but... Mm. It, what we're, we're at the stage now in New York where you're the nostalgic 90s, for past iterations of gentrification. <laughs> Oh, Gabe may be part of the gentrification of Williamsburg, of which we speak. Oh, yes. Is that fair or unfair? It is fair. I'm okay. an agent of change. You want to make it worse so people are aware of the conditions and then rise up. Look, we are, we're not going to have progress until everybody sees that we're all getting screwed. Exactly. So, so how's it going? How's the progress going? <laughs> and you, of course, are from the Upper West Side. My dad was in Harlem and my mom was on the Upper West Side. I went back and forth. Okay. I would take the three train to 145th Street to get to my dad's right. house. And if you were on the train, you would stand next to a white person because you knew at 96th Street you were guaranteed to get a seat right, at that point. Exactly. But that's no longer the case. We've evolved past that now. No, right. you can it's get kale up. chips up there now. Right, yeah. <laughs> we have snacks laid out. Cheese doodles, one of your favorites. I want to have a little vote. Who likes these cheese doodles? The, let's call these the puffies. Raise your hand for the puffy. The puffy. And crunchy? Yeah, that's what I thought. Wow. Yeah, okay. Crunchy always wow. wins. Crunchy wow. wins. Why? <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up. The, the, the puffy ones never get the chance to be spicy because of their second-class citizenship. <laughs> They're not given the same agency. If they had right. self-determination, they could choose to be spicy, jalapeno, or whatever they wanted. So I've always had an affinity for the underdog Cheetos. Right. They're, like, essentialized. Right. Like, all puffies 
look the same, taste the same. Life hack, though, is you can just take the a you can take a little hack. bit of chili pepper and just <laughs> sprinkle it right on there. Dave is going to be sprinkling DIY <laughs> tips throughout the show, by the way. Jay. Yes. I want to ask you some questions about you and what makes you tick. Okay. Okay. We already know that she's puffs and dark and stormies do, but I wanted to know if you could tell us about your life and how you started doing what you're doing now. Yeah, well, you know, I, I grew up in the WBAI family back in the 70s and the 80s. I grew up in a real counterculture, hippie, activist-oriented family. And of course, grew up right when hip-hop was blossoming here in New York, so that became a big part of my identity. And in 1989, I was a 16-year-old uh, with nothing to do in the summer, and my mother wanted me to find some kind of uh, positive activity, and I got uh, turned down from a job at McDonald's, so mm. she... Uh, <laughs> She happened to hear that someone named Anthony Sloan, who was uh, the engineer for the Evening News, Amy Goodman used to run the local Evening News here before Democracy Now!, and Anthony was looking for an intern to come and work with him over the summer, and Anthony also worked on a couple of other shows, a show named Creative Unity Collective, really awesome show that still airs today, it's really great uh, comedy, improv and sketch. He also ran another show every six months, it was a marathon of all unreleased Prince music, and I was a big Prince head. So I came in and auditioned to become an intern, and yeah, from 16 years old on, I was here working with Anthony and Amy Goodman. What was your audition like? Do you have a tape? I wish I had a tape. That would be valuable on eBay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he just had me read a news clip out loud, and I was good at reading things aloud, just coincidentally, and I guess you know, people always said I had a good radio voice. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a sportscaster. We used to do a little sort of news broadcast in grade school, and I would do the sports every That's week. That's so cute. <laughs> From then on, I was here just coming in every week, being able to absorb all this brilliance. You know, BAI is such a great place because there's all this esoteric knowledge from so many different worlds. And, you know, there's all these eccentric geniuses that represent all these different backgrounds and constituencies. Right, between um, Marxists and Trotskyists. <laughs> right, right. I was here for a couple of years when I was 18. Uh, BAI was looking at connect with the younger audience and get a hip-hop show. They're actually trying to get KRS-One originally, but mm. he had a million other things to do, I guess. He flaked out. Um, so he I went had, the WNYC route, or <laughs> right. NPR. He sold out. He, yeah, he was actually trying to start up Serial back then nice. and investigate Visionary. how hip-hop was stolen from the South Bronx. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, yeah, so I put in a proposal, and while I was still in high school, I started <laughs> off doing the show in 91. Uh, what grade were you in, by the way? A uh, senior in high school. So did you have, like, a year of the best social life ever? Or were the people at your school, like, we don't know what WBA is? Well, best social life ever would be a relative concept. Sure. Be close to rock bottom up until then and moved, so up, you got moved up a few rungs, yeah. I would got say. Yeah. Was there a moment when artists started vying to get airtime in your show? Yeah, well, when we started doing our show, there was no Hot 97. There was no such thing as commercial hip-hop radio. You know, traditionally all the... the box? There was on TV, there was the box on cable, and of course there was video music box, the pioneering hip-hop video show. Um, but on in terms of re commercial radio, Friday and Saturday night from 9 p.m. to midnight, that was the sort of ghetto of hip-hop radio. The only time you could hear hip-hop on the radio was those two three-hour slots. So anyone that was playing hip-hop on the radio, that was a precious commodity for the industry and record labels. So through most of the 90s, any artist that was coming out, they would come through to us. So everyone like uh, the Wu-Tang, uh, the Fugees, Biggie Smalls, like everyone like that, they would come make a trip um, and come see us. So after Hot 97 became the go-to outlet, our role sort of changed to providing an alternative to them. So then we would bring in more lesser known underground yeah. acts than that. But there was definitely a long stretch of people who are huge now that came to see us when they first was came Was there a, a watershed moment during this period where like things just kind of blew up and you your show went to like an, another level levels levels <laughs> i mean it's hard to say we're so accustomed on the internet to having really precise tracking of exactly what the response is how big it is what everyone's saying but you know when you're doing radio you just put it out there and you sort of guess based on the reaction you get out in the world how much of a connection is making there was no internet so you had to really strategize Project. about how to spread the word. There was another thing called record stores at that time. And people read things on printed paper was another thing that went on. So I made all these homemade flyers and brought them to all the record stores to let people know about it. And it was 
picked up. There was a really supportive hip hop community back then. Um, a guy named Bobito Garcia. Uh, he worked at Def Jam Records at that time and brought me in to hang out with them, connected me to all the record labels, connected me to the Source magazine. I started writing for them in 91. And of course, Bobito, also along with Stretch Armstrong, did a now legendary radio show that started yes. about six months before mine. Stretch Armstrong show with Bobito. So pretty quickly, you know, there was a really strong grassroots hip hop community at that time that I was welcomed into and got to help build throughout the 90s. So everyone knew each other on the ground floor? Yeah, and that's one of the lessons I wish people could learn today now that everyone has a public voice on the internet. If you were in hip-hop in the 90s, everyone knew each other, and anything that you said, you'd be accountable for it in person. You'd be online behind that rapper in McDonald's <laughs> pretty soon. And there was a particular time I learned that. Speaking of KRS-One, we were playing a live performance that they did in Japan. It was KRS, uh, Kenny Parker, Willie D, and uh, KRS-One's wife at the time, Miss Melody, who sadly has uh, passed away since then, which is going to make the next part of the story even worse. I think they were assuming that nobody spoke English and everyone wasn't trying that hard, and Miss Melody especially was sort of mailing it in that night. So we did something I would never do now, and after the tape ended, we started kind of making fun of Miss Melody being whack on the mic that night. Mm. So you can probably guess where the story is going. About a week later, I'm backstage at the Apollo, and this, 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 the show is pretty new for me, so this is really exciting. I'm backstage at the show, meeting all these people. So someone brings a couple people over to meet me, and it's uh, KRS-One's brother, Kenny Parker, and Willie D, another band member, both very large gen gentlemen, as is KRS. So Kenny looks at me, and he looks at Willie D, and he says... This is the guy I was telling you about you when he was to. talking about Melody. So I thought, well, I'm going to die backstage at the Apollo. It's a good place to go, though, this you got to admit. Cinematic. Historic. Yeah, yeah, you know, I'll, 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 take, I'll take this yeah. as a way to go. Then they both start cracking up, and Kenny says, uh, you're right, she was terrible that night. Oh, my God. <laughs> so I got my reprieve that night, but I've, you know, I've carried with me ever since then, don't. Don't say anything right. with your public voice that you wouldn't say to Kenny Parker's face backstage at the Apollo. That's a good, everyone should tweet that, that lesson. I could definitely feel throughout the course in the 90s that within the hip-hop world, people were enjoying and appreciating what we're doing. Like People will still come up to me nowadays and say, you know, I heard Wu-Tang for the first time on your show. Like, I'm, it's, it's a sign of your aging, but also a really flattering thing to know. Like People sort of grew up on your show, and a lot of people who... Like Just Blaze, great producer, told me he heard the woo for the first time on the show. Like a lot of people who are out there representing the culture now sort of learned how to represent by listening to the show. So like seeing those connections has definitely been a great thing. Any ones that you regret having empowered? <laughs> well, that guy Byron Crawford I was talking about, I kind of gave him his start. and <laughs> He took things to a bad place. Um, <laughs> other than that, not really. So how long did it take before you were kind of a known entity? And would people recognize your voice? Like if you were, went to a McDonald's or wherever and you ordered a quarter yeah. pounder. A McDouble, two McDoubles, Yeah, whatever please. they were. It was a McDLT era, I think. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> were you recognized via your voice then? Once in a while, far less often than when you're speaking inside a box on the internet and people are seeing your face. But right. yeah, occasionally, it definitely like we, like we were at a Prince concert, there was a big following for our Prince specials if we were at a hip-hop event once in a while. Radio is a funny thing because you sit in a room by yourself doing it and you basically go through life anonymously even if there's a substantial number of people listening right. most of the time. And there, you, know, you didn't have that internet, we're all internet famous phenomenon. So having someone say, hey, is that, are you on the radio? is a pretty amazing thing. Yeah, we get that. Yeah. <laughs> like my parents, <laughs> yeah. his parents, they totally recognize it. My voices. dad really loves the show. He does, right? <laughs> so what about your career as a, does anyone use the word vlogger? What do we, what do we call you, you, you people? I, I guess, <laughs> I, I guess makers. vlogger is, I try to say something like cultural commentator, which sounds sure. to adults like gainful employment. <laughs> right. But I, I guess, yeah, I guess okay. I'm a professional vlogger. I started my website, Ill Doctrine, in 2007. So I have been... this was, been, what, set eight years after? Wait, I'm bad at math. How many years after? Uh, I don't want to accept that it's that long either, but no, it was... No, after you started radio. I started radio in 91, and I started oh. that. Well, yeah. okay, yeah, so... <laughs> 16 years. Believe, 16 years. I'd, I'd, I'd love to truncate things that way, right. believe so would my hairline. 
But um, well, I, I should say I started blogging, blogging around 2003. I did one of the first hip hop blogs at hiphopmusic.com and kind of similarly built up an online hip hop community. Um, like literally, it was hiphopmusic.com, yeah. right? Yes. Pretty ground floor. Yes. Website. Has um, someone tried to buy that domain from you? Yeah. Mm, they haven't tried hard enough. Uh, <laughs> but yes. Do you have a price that you would let it go for? We're probably not allowed to say it, but yes, that'd have to be a lot of zeros. Okay, got it. It's just a lot jokes. of sentimental attachment. Right. Um, but yeah, so I have been doing that for a long time, and hip-hop blogging, it reached a point where it started off being a community where you could really exchange ideas, but it, more and more it was just kind of basically the Byron Crawford era where you rely on shock value and being offensive to get over, and then it was just whoever had the freshest MP3 leaks, and there's no writing or thought going on at all. For a lot of good bloggers who were sharing music, no shots at any of those people. But I'm going to tell became, Byron. Oh, you can tell Byron. <laughs> okay. He, he already knows. I kind of lost my love for textual blogging, and the video blogging medium was just kind of jumping off at that time, and there was no one really representing from a hip-hop space yet, and... I saw Steve Allen once talking about the golden age of television, and he said, if you get into something early enough, you're a pioneer by default, mm. no matter how mediocre you are. So I try, to, I try to find places where I can plant a flag for hip-hop and be one of the first people to sort of carve out that space for us to represent. So I started doing that in the video blogging realm in 2007, and pretty quickly just really struck a chord in a particular way. Like, it was a great creative challenge, sort of making the visuals and the audio and everything come together to make the message work. And right away, I could see this, it, it connects with people in a way that other media don't online. Like I could, especially once I started getting into racial issues and political topics more and more, is this something about that form allows people to really make a connection and want to share ideas. Reggie, how do you remember meeting this guy back in the day? Oh yeah, when we first met, it was like, hey, you're Jay Smooth, hey, I'm Reggie. Hey, what's up, how's, that, how's it going? And that, Pretty much. So he was like really like detached yeah. and snobby. Yeah, yeah, no. It Fame was, had it, already it, gone it, to his head. No, no, it was. That's why I thought you have that. You have that same was, affect today. Yeah. yeah, I'm all about you know bigging up whomever comes from WBAI. Mentioned the fact that this uh, guy came from WBAI right. and did his thing, and I would have done the same thing if I was around when Yoko Ono was the librarian. And According to Laura, she was yeah. our record librarian. She was the record day. librarian, John Lith and, just, and John Lithgow back uh, in the seventies was the arts was, part of that same was the show, arts director. John Goodman used to be part of a show called the Roseanne. Uh, Hour. No, 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 no. It was called. It was pre Roseanne. Pre Roseanne. It was called the Citizen Kafka Show. Tell us about your jobs before this, like how you paid the bills. I had a wide variety of low-paying jobs over the years. For most of the 90s, my first job was I was a counselor slash assistant teacher at a group home in upstate New York in Hawthorne. Um, it's like a residential facility for quote-unquote emotionally disturbed kids, which just means you had a rough family life for the most part and have a lot of trauma to recover from. So that was a really amazing, intense, emotionally draining, tremendously educational experience for me. Um, working with these kids, just learn so much about human nature and our resilience, how we react to trauma. It's a great, great experience that I draw a lot from in all the other work I do. And after that, I was in the dot-com world for a while, programming really early, ugly websites. I mentioned I was working at The Source. I was doing freelance writing the whole time. I played poker for a living for about a year and a I half know that. on the Internet. Maybe um, I didn't know. Uh, Where do you keep your money when you do that? Is that like Costa Rica or? I, the less we say about that, the better. Mm. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> it was on a, it, in a totally legal website, legal mm. in whatever sure. country it was. Anyway, right. so after that, um, I worked for an oral history project, StoryCorps, for oh, a while, right. which was yeah. another great experience. Did five or six hundred interviews for them. You get to hear a two-minute clip on the radio, but the actual 40-minute sessions are so much richer than you ever get to hear. In those clips, you know, I think it was frustrating for a lot of us. It's like storytelling blue balls. When you hear it. <laughs> but you have a very interesting relative, specifically your grandfather, Theodore Strongen. Yeah, I have a lot of very interesting relatives, if you're measuring right. by levels of dysfunction. I have a musical and artistic pedigree, for sure. Uh, my dad was a poet who uh, 
worked closely with Guylan Kane, who was one of the original last poets. Um, so I grew up in that milieu, going to see Amiri Baraka and people like that. Um, and my mom is a jazz musician, grew up in the jazz world. My mother's father, Theodore Strongin, was a music critic for the New York Times for many years. He was a classical composer. He taught classical music at uh, Bennington, among other places, and then uh, wrote about music uh, for most of the time my mom was growing up. He did the New York Times coverage of the Beatles' first appearance, I believe, on the Ed Sullivan Show. And the piece is pretty cool for me because he brought in my then 15-year-old mother to be the sort of teenage expert on this whole Beatles <laughs> phenomenon. So it's a, it's a pretty great piece if you look it up. There's, he sort of tongue-in-cheek, self-deprecatingly approaches it like I'm a classical critic treating this right. Beatles performance as if it's a classical composition. And there's a pretty great clip on YouTube, which I didn't discover until recently, where the Beatles did a press conference the week after that, and someone asked them about... Uh, my grandfather's review. Um, they asked, so they asked. Uh, so Theodore Strongin said you had unresolved leading tones, a false modal frame, they ending, totally do. ending up as a plain diatonic. <laughs> and then, and then John Lennon replied, "Well, we're going to see a doctor about that." Oh, very funny. <laughs> it was a pretty classic moment yeah. that my grandfather. Nice. Speaking of which, Beatles or Rolling Stones? Like, in Pulp Fiction, they say Beatles or Elvis, but I would say Rolling Stones. Why would you even compare the <laughs> Beatles with Elvis? <laughs> Beatles and Rolling Stones, but not Beatles and Elvis. Yeah. Elvis you know, is a pretender. I mean, the Beatles are innovators. So they well, all, they all started well, yeah, out yeah. in yeah. different forms of being derivative, but I think... <laughs> they, you know, I yeah, grew up um, being strictly a Beatles head. I came to appreciate the Rolling Stones more as I got older... And then at some point... And you point, learned you can't always get what you want. <laughs> yeah. But then at nice. some point, I actually listened to the lyrics to Brown Sugar for the first time. And it, it kind of killed the whole vibe. I, I went a long time without realizing what was actually going on. That, in that it wasn't a, a, a taste bud conversation. Right. It wasn't about the for like new the, 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 Starbucks the, flavor right. at all. Right. Your grandfather, Theodore Strongen. Mr. Strongen was born in New York in 1918. He attended Harvard University and Bard College, where he studied music and biology. His specialty was entomology, the study of insects. Ooh. He identified several rare species of beetles. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, the Take beetle credit for fetish. It. No, my grandfather was a genius. He was on the internet way like before the World Wide Web existed, and like, like. Uh, 80, like, I, I want to say... Oh, he's late, Al Gore? He, he told Al Gore about it. He was, I mean, he was way before there was a World Wide Web. He had the thing where you, when you had the actual telephone, and you placed the thing into the, and then it sent it through. So, yeah, he was communicating with people on the 80s, and he tried to show me. He gave me this Texas Instruments computer, but I just used wow. it to play Space Invaders. And about 10 years later... Everyone in the world started discovering the internet. I was like, my grandfather was on top of things in the 80s. What if he was a spy and you just outed him as a spy? Because what you're describing, no one else his, has his, seen. The statute of limitations <laughs> is up. He, like, leaked some documents. Maybe he was a spy. He what? <laughs> Mr. Strong began writing about music for the Times in the 63, and within his first few months at the paper, he produced an extensive report about the acoustical deficiencies of Philharmonic, now Avery Fisher Hall, with materials from a secret architect's report showing that the hall's interior had to be rebuilt. Muckraker. Muck, musical <laughs> muckraking. An acoustical muckraker. An acoustical mu muckraker, yeah. Yeah. Um, he just blew I, went, I wish that. my mom had come. This is more than I knew I about my grandfather. I wanted your mom to come. You're I want quite to ask a muckraker yourself. About you. There was one time my mom and I went to see my grandfather when he lived in Florida, and I was learning about uh, Alger Hiss in history class at that time. And do you call him Algie? <laughs> No, but so, so someone called, and my grandfather hung up the phone and said, oh, that was Alger Hiss's wife. We're going over tonight. So, uh, so. Wow. <laughs> Who was the most exciting person you've ever met? It doesn't have to be a celebrity. Through your videos or through your radio. Hmm. Most exciting person I've ever met. I mean, I get to meet a lot of teachers and people who work with kids who use my videos in their classroom when they want to talk about racism and sexism and other issues like that, or people who have said that they took my videos and it helped them sort of talk out tough issues with their family. You know, some people told me, like, it helped them come out of the closet with their parents. I mean, there's a part of my brain that is excited whenever any random celebrity, re like, if, oh, well, Rob Schneider retweeted me. Like, there's, there's a part of my brain. Well, that is a... That's Isn't he an anti-vaxxer? 
<laughs> no, he, uh, he well, he's yeah, he's a Republican weirdo, yeah. not yeah, but some someone like that, like this, yeah, that know. part of my sort of lizard brain said, oh, brain a famous person acknowledged me. I've got that in me, but it's really those sort of connections I make with real people, but also like Rob, Rob Schneider. Schneider. <laughs> 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 um, but also, when I meet people like Ralph McDaniels or Large Professor, like hip hop icons, it's sort of were my models for how to represent and express ideas in a humane, positive way. Like, when they know mm -hmm. about my stuff. Like, coming on on Friday nights after Chuck D and him always giving me this really generous That's introduction, um, knowing that Cool Herc, uh, creator of hip-hop, tunes into the show every week. Like, th things like that. Um, I don't feel guilty about right. caring that a famous person is acknowledging me because it's someone who taught me how to represent what I want to represent. Are you ever protective of your, like, WBAI past? In, in other words, do you ever get, you're like, yeah, of course you know Ill Doctrine, but what about the little radio show that could and did? <laughs> or is that just me projecting? Um, I, I don't know if I feel protective. I mean, it's, it's interesting that I'm best known for yeah. doing these video commentaries online, which are usually politically oriented. There's a lot of people who don't know that I'm a hip-hop guy. They think I'm named Jay Smooth because I'm like a, a pickup artist or <laughs> well, a, a, yes, a, it, a cast you member hear from Jersey sides, Shore or sides, something yeah. like that. Both sides. Um, that. That's why I watched at first. Right. And, <laughs> you were, and I yeah, was like, I'm learning something from this pickup artist. Yeah, he, you and, should right. hear the lines about like heteronormativity and patriarchy. He tries to... <laughs> See, that's how advanced the game is, yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, I think that's, that's been a blessing because I think a lot of people who try to speak about politics come from within either an activist or academic or theoretical bubble and are accustomed to speaking to other people inside that bubble and don't really transmit the ideas in a way that the other 99% of the world is going to want to connect with. I just want with. to challenge that notion of the 99% because I find that to be really problematic, <laughs> a really problematic framing. It's kind of detached from the actual I'm really trying to hold a space yeah, for what really, you're yeah. saying, but it's <laughs> difficult. Yeah, it's difficult. <laughs> but what I, I <laughs> the first video I saw that you did was uh, on uh, calling someone a racist versus saying what they said sounded kind of racist. Remember the difference between the what they did conversation and the what they are conversation. Those are two totally different conversations and you need to make sure that you pick the right one. The what they did conversation focuses strictly on the person's words and actions and explaining why what they did and what they said was unacceptable. This is also known as the that thing you said was racist conversation and that's the conversation that you want to have. The what they are conversation on the other hand takes things one step further and uses what they did and what they said to draw conclusions about what kind of person they are. This is also known as the I think you are a racist conversation. This is the conversation you don't want to have because that conversation takes us away from the facts of what they did and the speculation about their motives and intentions and those are things you can only guess at, you can't ever prove and that makes it way too easy for them to derail your whole argument. And that is the part that's crucial to understand. When you say I think he's a racist, that's not a bad move because you might be wrong. That's a bad move because you might be right. Because if that dude really is racist, you want to make sure you hold him accountable and don't let him off easy. And even though intuitively it feels like the hardest way to hit him is just run up on him and say, I think your ass is racist. When you handle it that way, you're actually letting him off easy because you're setting up a conversation that's way too simple for him to derail and duck out of. Just think about how this plays out every time a politician or a celebrity gets caught out there. It always starts out as a what they did conversation. But as soon as the celebrity and their defenders get on camera, they start doing judo flips and switching it into a what they are conversation. I have known this person for years and I know for a fact that they are not a racist and how dare you claim to know what's inside their soul just because they made one little joke about watermelon tap dancing and going back to Africa. And then you try and explain that we don't need to see inside their soul to know that they shouldn't have said all that about the watermelon and you try to focus on the facts of the situation but by then it's too late because the what they are conversation is a rhetorical Bermuda triangle where everything drowns in a sea of empty posturing until somebody just blames it all on hip hop and we forget the whole thing ever happens. We have these these conversations that can be difficult with people that we might have connections to or love and if like, oh, how do you talk to people without making them feel... Like your grandmother on your mom's side. <laughs> <laughs> Shh. Yeah, like my grandma. But, you know, God rest her soul. She loved you. She did. She did love me. So this is me big up in the old doctrine. So, A+. Plus. Well, thank you. The video is, is named How to Tell Someone They Sound Racist and it's sort of become like my free bird or stairway to heaven or something like that. Um, yeah. I made it in 2008 during the election season, I think reacting to Bill Clinton's weird comments about Jesse Jackson at that time. And, you know, it is, most of my videos are 
something was on the news that really vexed me, and I just rant about it into the camera for 10 hours and then so edit That's your process. And then edit it down, yeah. Jewels, guys, that's a jewel right there. Uh, yeah, yeah like I, when I have enough rage to fill up a tape, I, like, I just crush that rage into a diamond in the editor. So usually I do that, and the average YouTube video gets, it gets views for about 48 hours, and then it goes away. But this video, for years, people have just kept coming back to it, and that's the one that people probably use the most in sort of their, their syllabus or their curriculum, and it's sort of become part of the canon of arguing about racism online. Trying to make sure racism doesn't go away. Yeah, thankfully, that market <laughs> remains strong. Um, it was a lesson for me of how much hunger there is for ways to sort of talk about race in a way that's a little bit less painful. Like you say in your video, you will be making a stronger case when you don't oversell your, your like, side, when you make certain... It's not concessions in a moral or ethical way, but it's more like, sure, blah, 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 blah. But, as opposed to, like... Yeah, I mean, I think... It's a Machiavellian thing, almost. I don't think there's any right or wrong way to take on any argument or dispute or disagreement. I mean, look, sometimes it's just not going to be your day to try to educate somebody or to tell them your point of view. Some, like what I just did. Some, sometimes, sometimes you're just going to need to practice self-care and let someone know, I don't need you to understand why you need to stop doing that, but you need to stop doing that. And there are other times when you feel up to it, you can try to be precise and try to find common ground in a thoughtful conversation. And I think you just need to be real with yourself about what your goal is in that conversation. But I think there are, there are times when you need the catharsis of just telling somebody off, but you can also sort of get addicted to the catharsis of telling somebody off and just do that as the default in every interaction. And you, I think you can sort of mistake bluntness for precise, effective communication. And I, I think part of that is wanting to make everyone conform to the language that we use inside our bubble. Feels like we're being more precise, but it's really just being self-indulgent instead of trying to meet someone halfway. Picking your And battles. speak to them. Like, is your objective to communicate or is your objective to have the feeling of telling someone right. they're wrong and you're right? Sometimes that is going to be what you need. Right. I'm not hating that, but I think we kind of fall into a default of just, I'm going to alienate from your humanity and tell you off. And so, you, like, you need to know the difference between doing that because you need to and doing that because right. you want to. Therapy versus organizing. One of your biggest recent media hits was when Nancy Giles accused you of co-opting hip-hop. She was, well, I should say, uh, my father is black and my mom is white. I self-identify as black and, and mixed. I don't consider those. Um, Mutually exclusive. Right. But so she, in, in this conversation, we were on the Chris Hayes show debating the Starbucks Race Together initiative. <laughs> and uh, in Nancy... the entire racial harmony of this country was put into the hands of baristas. It's a weird thing to just shove it into just one... Just corporate, top-down, <laughs> yeah. just the way it should be, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I just wanted to give the contest, yeah. But at one point in the, the panel discussion, she, I guess, had been assuming I was white and thought she could score points by ah. accusing me of sort of trying to talk black and that she did this weird yeah. imitating so, uh, hip hop. So meta, that was but so wrong. hilarious. It was, yeah, that so was I had so to hilarious. awkwardly try to finesse telling her I'm actually black <laughs> within, right. within the constraints of this panel. So kind of, she it, did by saying, I'm black. <laughs> well, I said, uh, yeah. Well, I said, well, that's also funny because oh, yeah. I'm actually black, and you assumed otherwise. Right. And this is the kind of awkward conversation we can look forward to right. in Starbucks across America. <laughs> um, so that oh, that be amazing. that became a big a vi like, viral moment. Have you checked moment. your white privilege yeah. today? <laughs> that sort of become my franchise is yeah. telling people I'm actually black. Like I was like that was the number one trend on Facebook from that. Right. It was a real it was a real lesson in how the randomest things can just become a piece of media that right. defines you. Shout Luckily I think I've done black. enough work that I'm not known only for that. Right. Yeah. So you identify as both mixed and black. And yeah. has that changed over time because of your age or because of the you know, the times in which we live or is that have you had basically the same self identification since uh, you know, you can remember? I would say basically the same. I mean, I think my understanding evolves over time of how things like the sort of residual white privilege that I'll get from my appearance factors into that. And I think, you know, it's a lifelong process of learning how your self-identity and the way people will choose to perceive and categorize you, how those things intersect and don't matter to each other but also do. I mean, and I think our collective understanding of race 
uh, continues to evolve in the country, albeit at a glacial pace. Um, so, I, I mean, I think being someone who identifies as black but is visually indistinct, it gives you a lot of lessons about how sort of random and unscientific and illogical and absurd America's racial construct is, and at the same time, how real it is and how we all have to right. figure out how to live with it. When I was a teenager and I had those awkward moments, I really hated it, but now I can sort of appreciate it. For people who aren't at all sensitive to this stuff, like it's hard to explain that race is both a construct and racism is very real. Right. Like you walk down the street and something may happen to you because of the way yeah, you look. Know, yeah, it's always been this strange goal Americans have to feel like we're over a race right. by never talking right. about race again, which is you know usually when you have a healthy relationship with something, you're comfortable talking about right. it when it comes up, but we can't wait to never ever talk about race again for some reason. So, and that, so that's a rhetorical angle people will use. So yeah, it is a social construct. And that means if we just stop talking about it, it'll go away. I heard someone say once, well, money is also a social construct. Right. That's a good, yeah. Mm. But I haven't been able to convince my landlord <laughs> to, to, you know, to let go of that abstraction. So it is, you know. And I think you can be realistic about its origins and think about how to grapple with it as a reality right. in our lives. Your mom is Jewish? Is yes. that right? Okay. I mean, we didn't... My grandfather was a staunch atheist and sort of so renounced. The so. best Jews are. Just kidding. Yeah, yeah, some, yeah. some of the so, best Jews are. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't, really, I didn't really grow up learning that much culturally, but I'm Torah. proudly of Jewish ancestry. Yes. Right. right. I would say my parents would, like, if I brought home a religious Jew, they would sit shiva. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you do when someone dies. You eat a lot. I used to not identify as Jewish because I associated it with religion. Now I'm actually defiant about it because people are like, how can you be Jewish? you're not religious. We had Judah Friedlander on the show. His mom is Catholic and his dad is Jewish. It was like, people look at you like you killed their dog when they find out you're only half Jewish. He was like, Hitler defined Jews as someone who only had one Jewish grandparent. Like, so in some ways, Hitler was a lot more accepting of Jews than other Jews are. <laughs> I always say, like, my standard is like, if you're Jewish enough for Hitler, you're Jewish. Which some people may find problematic and empowering of Hitler. Like, Jews used to be treated like it didn't matter how you identified. It was the, a blood question, right? Anyway, this was more therapeutic for me. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I wanted to ask you like, how you identify as Jewish or bluish. Our friend Adam Serwer, I think, is fond of that, that phrasing. I don't always bring it up just because I don't want to be misleading since we never practiced or anything. But you... Mm. Keep going. I'm not going <laughs> to... No, but it's I, not misleading. It's only misleading right. if you're like, I'm a rabbinical Jew. Do you feel like it's still synonymous with being religious? Not necessarily. I mean, like when the guy Jewish. outside the truck oh, yeah. asks... Oh, well, yeah. Right. Sorry. I didn't mean to be dismissive of uh, messianic zealots. <laughs> <laughs> like if a religious person asks you if you're Jewish, is your response different from if a non-religious Jewish person does? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if I ever get that. I usually say my mom's black and my dad is white. I mean, my dad's black. I was like, oh, you throw a curveball. Okay, oh, cool. Oh, I just dole is all myself. Oh, yeah, right. I thought we could open it up to questions from the audience. The president was just recently speaking about guns, and we as a nation have been talking about guns. In my hometown, Chicago, guns are so ridiculously glorified. I grew up on songs like Stop the Violence and We're All in the Same Gang. This melody was in one of the videos. How do you feel like hip-hop can start to take control of that issue? and bend back towards putting, stopping violence and hip-hop being a more positive thing? Yeah, that's a tough question. Obviously, gun violence is just an endemic American problem, just an ongoing crisis. It's just at the core of our culture. You know, The Onion just reposts that same headline every time. There's nothing we can do to stop this, says the only nation where it regularly occurs. <laughs> so obviously, this is not specifically a hip-hop problem, but... I think it's naive to claim that uh, the messages we put out there have no effect whatsoever on people's outlook. You know, industry rule number 4080. Record company people are shadier than ever in 2016, and we have this trend more than ever of record labels seeing artists as disposable. You know, now that it's harder to really build a huge ongoing mainstream pop star, the easiest thing to do is find someone who has quick internet buzz and milk that for the next three months and then throw that away. And in hip hop, you see that happening with people like Chief Keef who just have no perspective about the world, are caught up in the most negativity, a record label swoops in, 
uses them to feed on the public's worst instincts to cash out for three months, and then they throw him back out in the street. Or in the case of uh, Bobby Schmurder, they literally let him go to jail <laughs> right after the record comes out and leave him there. I'm not sure what the solution to that is. I mean, I think there's a lot of alternative hip-hop out there. J. Cole sold a lot of records. Now, all of his gender stuff is not totally in place, but he's trying to be thoughtful as best he can and provide an alternative, and that sold a lot without really having any radio hits or anything like that. So, I mean, I think we can support the stuff that provides an alternative and we can cultivate the hip-hop spirit that we want on a local community level, which is where hip-hop has always really thrived the most. You know, Jeff Chang talks about that powerfully in his book, Can't Stop, Won't Stop, just sort of gives a cultural history of hip-hop. That That's always 99% of how hip-hop is manifesting in our world is amongst ourselves on a community level. You know, I did a teaching artist thing in the South Bronx a few years ago, and I got to see something that I would have never known or guessed, that all these kids, these eighth graders in the South Bronx have their little black books doing graffiti, and I got to have uh, Tracy 168, one of the pioneers, come in and talk to them. So there's that hip-hop spirit that we grew up on is still out there all around, and we can cultivate it and plant seeds, you know, like... Like Grace Lee Boggs said, go out and plant a garden. We can do that with hip hop and try to have some kind of countercultural action going on. I mean, that's, I wish I had a better answer than that because that feels meager, but I think that's one thing we can do. Between environmental issues, I don't know more, uh, missing and murdered indigenous women, there's a lot of native issues that are taking root now in some of the younger uh, generations. Are you uh, seeing any uh, native? Uh, hip-hop artists, any of these guys, Frank Juan perhaps, or anybody else breaking through uh, in, from, from your perspective? I mean, the, there's definitely a lot of great artists out there. There's a group named Tribe Called Red that I think is really dope. I'm always bad with names, but there's a bunch of other ones out there. Um, and we definitely try to promote that kind of thing as best we can. But I think it's hard if you don't fit into really particular boxes to get a lot of push outside of these sort of alternative spaces. So I, I definitely hope that happens more. I'm kind of taking some time off. Needed about six months to process a proper rant about Donald Trump, I think. So, <laughs> But, yeah, no, this month I'm definitely going to be getting his, back on it. Ad, his latest ad. Uh, that's the thing. It. You can literally, yeah, it's hard because you feel like you don't want to give him any more exactly. attention, but I think that horse is out of the barn yeah. at this point. It's not just a Trump issue. You know, it's an American problem, and it's also... A these, Mexican problem, a Muslim right. problem, a woman's problem. But these are, these are the GOP chickens coming home to roost. This has been, they started something called the Southern Strategy and decided they were going to have a certain base. For decades, that base was enough to keep them in office. Right. That base doesn't give them the numbers anymore. They can either decide to enter the modern world or keep clinging to that base more desperately and feed them more and more fear and paranoia. That's what the GOP's been doing with a polite cover on it for years now. Donald Trump's just stripping the cover away. I was wondering, Jay, your thoughts on the recent television show Empire and what it has done for or to hip-hop? Mmm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's an entertaining show. You know, I think there's a place for camp in the world. I don't love everything that goes on, and I think when you're starting something and people aren't watching it yet, you can sort of be balancing different influences. Like, I think they had a mix of trying to take themselves seriously and being absurd in the first season, and then once people started watching and they were aware of the reaction, they kind of veered all the way into absurd in a way that made it a little harder for me to stomach. It's a tough thing when you've never had enough representation to have to meet the standard of representing your people at their best. My friend, the rapper Invincible, said about female MCs, about Nicki Minaj specifically, that uh, you know she has her complaints about Nicki Minaj, but it's the equivalent of if Old Dirty Bastard was the only male rapper, we would not be happy about Old Dirty Bastard, but because there's 10 other members of the Wu-Tang Clan balancing him out, and there's all these other forms of representation, he can be what he is, and, and so is good. balanced out by all these other things. So I think it's tough for a show like Empire to be able to indulge just being trashy and ridiculous without it carrying a weight and a burden that it wouldn't if you were just doing a white show that's balanced out by a thousand other white it's shows. It's like the L word, like lesbians also deserve crappy television. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I have a question about going from audio, the verbals, to visually. People seeing you. 
versus here yeah. in Yeah, radio was good for me as sort of an introvert who uh, is, you know, is not that into going out and being social. I have to spend so much more time looking at myself to edit these videos. But you're still alone. I mean, I'm pulling off the like illusion much better. I mean, you're still better. in your house, like, doing it, right? It's funny how you, just by being physically present in something, you feel like you're interacting more with the world. Yeah, I mean, I think that was a blessing for me getting to do radio when I was 16 years old. When I would meet people for the first time as a teenager, there'd be a, that sort of hitch in the conversation where people say, and what are you? Sometimes it would just be a silent thing that went on in their heads. But as I'm gradually trying to build my self-esteem and identity as a teenager, I'm aware of all those little things. So being on the radio where people are strictly connecting with my voice sort of took all those other cues away that made interacting awkward. It allowed me to connect in a way that felt more comfortable for me. So I think radio was powerful in that so way that for That probably me. allowed you to have, in some ways, I, okay, that's way too leading. Did that allow you to have the, the <laughs> did that allow you to have the confidence then to go into video? Do you think that let you become more comfortable and then approach video in a way that you couldn't have done without this kind of intermediary empowering thing that happened to not have a visual aspect? Um, I mean, I think you learn a lot just about how to fill up the space right. and communicate like, effectively. Uh, I, no, it, it probably is. Yeah, I don't know if I can think that deeply, this deep into the conversation. Mm -hmm. And we've only had one drink. <laughs> thank you guys so much for coming today, and thank you so much, Jay Smooth.